Good morning, everybody. Welcome after this start of the new season. It's a great pleasure. It's a really an honor to uh, introduce a very exceptional person uh, because, uh, how shall I say, Ivan, uh, many people in his place would have uh, used all the opportunities to get out of Sarajevo in the Civil War as fast as possible. Because uh, why, uh, why be present in an ethnic war which is not yours? The ethnicity is fighting there and in the initial stage it was everybody against everybody. Uh, Serbs uh, against Croats, Croats against Bosnians, Bosnians against uh, Serbs. Thereafter there were realignments, but initially this was a uh, three-partied war where the three parties fought against each other. Uh, the Jewish community of Sarajevo, which was already very, very, very small at the time, uh, could get out thanks to the effort of Ivan. He could get out, his family could get out, his family stayed for through uh, a civil war, which for those of you who have been to Sarajevo and understand, the topography of the uh, of the uh, city. It's uh, if, uh, by the way, Dubrovnik is to some extent the same. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, if uh, if they uh, shoot you from Harazetim uh, Chasvechalila into downtown uh, uh, Jerusalem, and uh, you have on uh, the Midrachov on one side. One side and on the other side, the other side. I mean, this is this was a, an ugly, a very ugly civil war. And to recall to you that the latest, more scientific research, which has scaled down the the estimates from the original ones by the parties, was that in Bosnia alone, under thousand people, mostly civilians, died or were brutally murdered. Biggest case, of course the famous Srebrenica case, where we speak about 8,000 uh, dead, and that in the Croatian war, uh, 10,000 people were, were murdered. These are the scientific figures. So, uh, Ivan instead stayed on during the whole of the war, helped as chairman of the Jewish communities. All the parties did a lot. You have here... Uh, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have here the purple. You have here the story which has appeared in Changing Jewish Communities, the interview with Ivan, and this uh, turned into a movie, uh, a moving movie by the Italian state television, uh, with English uh, in English, which we will show after Ivan gives a short introduction. Then afterwards he'll take questions. Well, Ivan was the head of the Jewish community of Bosnia Herzegovina until he emigrated to Israel in 1996 when the Battle of Sarajevo was over. He was vice chairman of the Yugoslav Federation of Jewish Communities, and he was in charge of these rescue efforts and the humanitarian relief uh, supported by the joint in uh, Sarajevo. He got for that the Légion d'honneur from France. Uh, he's an architect by profession. I've seen some buildings he has built in Sarajevo, and he's presently employed by the Hebrew University at the Center for Jewish Art. I think the only thing I have to say before I give the word to, to Ivan that on the 30th, we have Simon Ploska, the director of Honest Reporting, to tell us about what Honest Reporting does. The veterans here may remember that we had Camera, Andrea Levine. So with that, we complete the two major uh, organizations on uh, media watching. Ivan, pleasure to have you here. Uh, so with such introduction, I have very few ways to add. Nobody needs to call me by a family name because it's unbreakable. So Ivan is quite okay. <laughs> and why I accept the invitation of Dr. Gassenfeld to come? Because this is a part of cycle of changing Jewish communities. And what I'm talking about is very unusual behavior of Jews in very unusual circumstances. So is the irony, the real explanation of the unique story of how a small Jewish diaspora community in Sarajevo engaged itself in an exper experiment of survival of Jews, Catholics, Muslims, and also Christians throughout still unnamed the war in Bosnia that marked the end of the 20th century? Maybe it is, since the picture of an average Jew, and especially the Jew endangered by the conventional circumstances Jews were living in 
for the last two millennia is of an underdog, the well-accepted victim of behavior irregularities in xenophobic attitudes of Christian West and Islamic East. Or maybe the birthright of a minority people is exactly that, to serve as a lightning rod for the frustrations of unfulfilled nationalistic aspirations and supposedly wrong place in the distribution of historical merits in the breakdown of society. But still, here we have a small diaspora community that stubbornly refuse to accept the stereotypic Jewish role and vanish in the wild pool of a nationalistic savagery. Even more, they dare to challenge the history <coughs> to influence her, refusing to be a victim but creating something very new in the modern European history. The feeling that Jews are those who could be addressed for help due to the simple fact that at the doors of the Jewish community in Sarajevo, unlike the other communities and organizations, nobody was asked about the nationality, but only about the need that brought him to the Jewish doorsteps. And all of that in the war on Sarajevo and Bosnia and Yugoslavia, where after 45 years of peace and progress, and such an ethnic melange, it appeared almost impossible to separate one ethnic group from another where ethnic mixing was a norm, not an exception. We, the Jews of Europe, suffered horribly because an uncaring world turned its back on us in times we now call the Holocaust. And great Jewish communities, which added so much to Europe's greatness, are no more. But we have survived using the tools with which we were left although we are not what we once were. I personally think we have done quite well. Most importantly, we have not forgotten the lessons of the past. We, the Jews of Sarajevo, this once beautiful, magnificent blend of East and West, worked hard to share those lessons with all our neighbors in Bosnia, Muslims, Croats, and Serbs. We Jews know somehow by instinct how to prepare for the worst and at the same time how to maintain our dignity. With that frame of mind, we did our work with 60 volunteers, less than half of who were Jews, and we gave our food, medicine, clothing, and even ran a radio and postal service. We Jews came into Bosnia, invited by Ottoman Sultans, and, Jews, and, and we as Jews made their, our way north some 500 years ago, and since then we have shared the fate of all our neighbors. Through the war and peace, good times and bad, and except for the period of Europe's blackest night, we really never knew the kind of anti-Semitism that existed in the uh, rest of Europe. Now, in these horrible times, when our brothers and sisters, relatives and friends were exterminating each other, we have been working especially hard to keep our doors open to everyone who provides sanctuary, health and friendship. During the war, the community premises became a mini miniature version of what Sarajevo had, had been before the war. In the Jewish neighborhood, came to include the entire city in its haven inside the Jewish community premises. Cold statistics cannot convey the reach of the Jewish community's service, just as cold statistics cannot convey the nurturing touch of a nurse's hand to the war wounded, to want, uh, the warmth of blanket when the windows are blown out, the satisfaction of a hot meal amid the mortar fire, the joy of hearing that loved ones are still alive. But here are the statistics anyway. During 1,350 days of the siege of Sarajevo, 11,000 persons were killed, among them 1,601 child. 50,000 persons were wounded during the siege. Daily average of grenades and rockets killing on the city was 329, and the record was 3,777 hits in July 22, 1993. In the same time, the Bosnian capital's Jewish community had operated three pharmacies to distribute for free 1.7 million prescriptions, organized the only house call medical service in the war zone with three doctors and three nurses, braving, shelling, and sniper fire to care for invalids, the sick, and the aged. Distributed hundreds of tons of food, blankets, clothes, and the weatherproofing material brought to the city by countless convoys through 38 checkpoints and its various armies, militias, and irregulars. Opened the daily soup kitchen that has served 120,000 uh, uh, 120, hot meals, created a private postal service to carry 100,000 letters in and out of the blockade, allowed each of the city's ethnic group to use a two-way radio, <coughs> the calls go both the ways to Zagreb, Croatia and Belgrade, Serbia, for 10,000 shortwave connections to, <coughs> to 
families in the outside world. The convoys, the Jewish community has organized a series of 11 evacuations, three by air early in the war, eight by overland routes after the airport was closed to civilians. Those operations were the cooperative project of Sarajevo Jewish leaders and the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, a global rescue and relief organization. Through those efforts, about 3,000 Sarajevo residents were ferried out of Bosnia killing fields. <coughs> and only one third were Jewish. But, but all of that carried to places safe from sniper fire and away from the artillery, places where heat in the winter and running water all day are not considered minor miracles reached destinations safely, spreading the word of how a Jewish community came to the aid of its city. And the rest is history. Okay. We'll take questions as usual. Ben Molo first, Professor Doy second, Edward Cohen of the Falk. absolutely fascinating and um, just brings home uh, an episode that really deserves to be publicized and, and better known, so I'm grateful that we've had the opportunity to see it. Two questions just come to mind. One, sort of a philosophical question, and two, just a very small technical question. First, it seems that this was an example of the best and worst in human nature. Uh, the coexistence, the mutual um, associations with, with each other, the mutual respects and even affection between the different groups and then the breakdown and the, the barbarism of human nature. What sort of conclusion do you take about human nature from this experience? And two, just a technical point, the ending of the film seemed almost like a bit anticlimactic. You spoke to the woman at the end who said she didn't even know it or realize it and you weren't even sure whether she was being truthful or not. It was like anticlimactic, anticlimactic. Was there a message in that or just it turned out that way? Uh, I'll answer first the second. It is. Intention was to give a hidden message. The microphone. <coughs> Should I raise my voice a little bit? Maybe you hear? Okay. Uh, there is a message. Uh, the last. Uh, the now I have to calm down. Uh, the story of that convoy happened in front of that house. The woman is owner of that house. People, killers who wanted to butcher those men in bus and the cars were situated in her house and she doesn't know. It's very typical for all wars. At the end, nobody does know anything. And that's the kind of message. That's a, let's say counter message. We did what we did, and I think this is unique what Jewish community in Sarajevo did. I don't recall, I, well, I flatter myself that I'm quite good in Jewish history, I don't remember that anywhere Jewish community stood to help their city, their town, in this way. And it's forgotten. Nobody remembers. Only we who live there or the, can tell the story. Well, your Muslim friend remembers. I'm talking about Jews because I thought at the end when I came here that uh, this is an important lesson which can show us how we could behave. I'm not talking about uh, Western uh, communities in Western countries where for sure never will happen such savagery like in Balkans, but whole Eastern Europe is full of smaller scattered communities in, in towns where tomorrow something like this can happen. And my question is, are we willing to do something, uh, to, uh, to act like we did for those three years, three and a half years? Because it's, it, uh, it was a message which was recognized, people spoke about it. Now, ten years after that, it's forgotten. And if you want to hear 
when I came here, first two years I was unemployed. Mm. And I offered to a couple of institutions, not to mention name now, that I could make a kind of manual of survival for Jews in endangered areas. Since I'm an architect, I was rejected as amateur who is not qualified to write such manuals. So this is the answer on your second question. The first question, look, it's, uh, I, again, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm qualified to answer it in the way you raise the question, but it's in human nature. We, in Balkans, we had three, four major wars in 100 years, and every time happened the same. Good neighbors, relatives, mixed families, killed each other, butchered each other, when everything passed, within a year or two, they again continue to live together and to do the same thing. And just, it's not a spiral of violence as we are talking about here. It's a spiral of violence which is rooted hundreds of years. And it's in, I, am, I can't say it's in gene, but it's, it is in blood. This primitive understanding of the, of the term blood revenge is still very much alive and kicking in that area. Some people are not even aware of that in the southern part in Kosovo in Albania, it's a law, still existing. So that's maybe just a part of the answer for your question. Uh, ben, Professor Ben Lerner. Yeah. And one who was living in the United States at that time, I can assure you that we knew, well, we, we knew almost nothing about it. Uh, uh, some of us have read the New York Times regularly, read about Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, and Herzegovina, so so on. And nobody understood who was who. Nobody understood who was, who was really Muslim and so on. And for the vast majority of Americans who got the news from TV, uh, there was almost no mention whatsoever of this. And in terms of the local newspapers of the New York Times uh, and, and, and other major uh, newspapers, uh, almost nothing was ever said. And it was never analyzed. It was never uh, really explained to us. Uh, so uh, that, that, that was a situation in uh, you know one of the uh, most knowledgeable kind of countries around, uh, which is a very sad story because you know, well, you know, as you know, it is. But if, if I may, can I just ask a personal question? It was mentioned earlier that you were awarded the French Legion of Honor. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is that part of the story? Part of this story? No. That has nothing to do with it. it, it of course, it has. <laughs> I got it. Uh, I, I was a. It's. I'm. Look, I'm. Uh, proud that I was recognized by one of the most anti-Semitic countries, which very rarely decorates even their Jews, not to mention the Jews from, uh, from outside of the France. I, I can be proud because uh, they were major players in there, and they knew, and they did it. They decorated me. This is personal pride. What you said is a sad truth. I was, during the war, quite a number of times out and in wishing to repay the service and goodwill and help of various Jewish institutions in the world, especially in the United States, I went on a couple of speaking tours through states. So I really crisscrossed the states from east to west coast, from north to south, speaking in various Jewish communities, giving interviews to Jewish and non-Jewish uh, press, and it's interesting. People uh, receive me uh, warm-heartedly, really. And as you said, without ba uh, background information, they didn't understand. They could. They didn't. They ha they were not able to understand this. How this ethnic melange can explode? For these short uh, moments, where I, which I spent in the various communities, I was I was trying just to give the basics. But the problem was, uh, press really did not present it as a case which should be historically put in front of the audience. I gave about a thousand interviews, so many, so many uh, business cards of the reporters from Sarajevo I got. Everybody got the same story. This is this, this is this, these are fighting this, these are fighting this. When I saw those articles, I usually asked just to get a copy of the article, Nobody understood. Nobody understood that you have in one unit two persons with the same family name, but one is Muslim, one is Serb. Nobody understood that uh, that 
Muslims on one side have the same family name like lives like Catholic Croats on the other side. Nobody understood that Croatian army was ethnically completely clean, only Catholics, but they had quite a number of mercenaries from Western Europe. Nobody understood that Serbs had a ethnically clean army with a lot of volunteers from uh, Russia, Greek, Romania, and so Greece, uh, Romania, and so and nobody understood the, uh, the most uh, intriguing thing. You had Muslim army, this army of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which was consisted of a good part of Catholics and Serbs fighting together with Muslims against Serbs and Croats who invaded them. And nobody understood at the end. This is the most intriguing part. When Mujahideen came, Mujahideens came to the Bosnian army, when they started to kill non-Muslim members of Muslim army, rather than people on the other side. So this is, don't, <laughs> don't be surprised that people don't understand. Many people from there will not understand also. Yeah. I'm a Jew, I can. <laughs> Um, I, I found the, the film very moving, actually. Um, I actually have a lot of family connections from Bosnia. Um, my father-in-law was from Travnik, and uh, a lot of his family was from Sarajevo. Um, and over the years, long before the war, I met a lot of these people, and so I had probably a much deeper knowledge than most people. One of the things I remember that they said was that the situation in Sarajevo was unique because every family had mixed marriages in it. So what actually happened in the war? Did, did families split and one go... Unfortunately. And, and husbands were killing wives and husbands no. were killing their wives' families and whatever? You had two, two, uh, two type of situations. One, like uh, my wife's relatives, family of my wife's relatives, uh, husband is Muslim, the wife is a Croat. They have two sons. They jo both joined the, the army, but one went to Muslim army, one went to Croat army. And in two years they were fighting each other. For two years. And she prayed only for them to be to be wounded, to come back, uh, to, to bring them back. Not to be in the situation to kill each other. That's one type of it. This is a very regular situation in uh, Balkans, especially in the Second World War. It was the case when part of the family was uh, joined communist partisans, and the part joined either Serbs, either either Serbian Chetnik, either uh, Croatian Ustashas, either Muslim militias. So it was very common. And the other part, other is what you said. Maybe husbands and wives didn't kill each other, but there were situations with close relatives where. Re, uh, let's say repaying old family debts with knives and axes. It's very, very common case there. And by the way, uh, you have, uh, to give you an example, we have now the situation in Kosovo, which is very clear, 80% of Albanians, and you have Albanians, Catholics, uh, Orthodox and Muslims, majority Muslim, of course, and you have Serbs on the other side. But you have Montenegro, in Montenegro, you have Albanian and Montenegrin Orthodox families and clans related by blood for centuries. And it's, here is the opposite situation. When, when in Venice and Dijon, they are running in, into mountains under protection of Orthodox. When Orthodox are in Dijon, they are running under protection of Albanian, also uh, Muslim Albanians. So, uh, I want to try. Uh, Muslims, uh, Orthodox, and Catholics, were they ethnically all the same people, or were they differently, different ethnically? They're all the same people. Mm. The, the main problem last 17 years is to prove by the national leaderships that they are different, that Serbs are from Iranian background, that Croats are from Gothic uh, uh, background and the Muslims are no 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 not Turks. That's the only that's the biggest no, mistake. I, I yeah. That Muslims are 
the, uh, the, uh, the uh, hairs of indigenous people from there. That they are only that the only them are Slavs who really have the right on the on the country. Mm-hmm. Basically, Bogomils were also Slavs. So the whole bunch of people living be- between the uh, Austrian border and Greece are Slavs, except Albanians, of course, and small minorities like us. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for this film, which I agree with the previous speaker. It's very moving. In fact, for me, one of the most moving uh, scenes was between you and your Muslim friend, the meeting there. And I want to ask you specifically about what you just said about the ethnicity and the fantasies, really, that people have about their own ethnicity, Croats, Serbs, and Muslims. You know, um, Muslims in uh, Bosnia are actually, this is a paradox, but Muslim is a religion, but they're actually considered a nationality. Now, this we have the same paradox in this country. When you have the Druze people, for example, which is a religion, but they are considered a nationality, whereas the Druze are really Arabs. They're Arabs of Druze religion. Now, the Muslims, which are called Turks by some of the Serb, uh, which you call the irregulars, those, uh, the thugs, which were killing Croats and Muslims, uh, they were called Turks. Of course, as you say correctly, they are not Turks at all. In fact, they are Islamized Slavs which were Islamized by the Ottomans uh, centuries ago. The majority of them were entirely. That's right. <laughs> but they're Islamized. They were, they're not Muslims before that. So, um, one could say, because you said something very interesting just a few minutes ago, you said, because I'm a Jew, I can understand it. Because to others, it sounds crazy. It sounds completely mad. You know, when you have people who are, as you say correctly, all really the same people, yet there are you know, uh, I come from a discipline of psychoanalysis, and, and Sigmund Freud talked about the, the narcissism of minor differences. There are only minor differences. The Serbs and Croats speak the same language. But they're different in religion and maybe in the alphabet, because one uses the Latin alphabet, the other uses the uh, Kyrillic, Kyrillic alphabet. Uh, but those minor differences become so major when there is a war. So, uh, you have all kinds of completely irrational things from a psychological point of view going on. And my question to you is if you could elaborate, um, because I have a colleague, uh, Volkan is well known, he wrote many books about the need for enemies. What he actually says is that groups which are living in close proximity, like the Serbs and Croats and Muslims in Bosnia, which is not such a huge country, and they're living in close proximity, and they're living quote unquote peacefully for a long time and then suddenly this war erupts and and the, the minor differences as I said become major and then they they believe that the other person the other group is totally different from them and that they are quite right in killing and shooting and murdering the other group so my question to you as a Jew when you look at those three groups from your point of view what is it exactly that you do understand that you think the other people don't? And also, did you not feel like it was a complete madness what was going on? If I may just correct you in one small sentence. Sure. You said they, somebody considered other side as different and killed them. I would say somebody considers himself different from the other people. That was the case here. Because that's why I told the uh, producer and the author of the movie to use this scene with the three fingers. These three fingers were crucial for the development of the situation and for many, many losses of life. And if you will travel through Bosnia these days and in the future, not in Sarajevo, Mostar, and the, most of Sarajevo is, uh, let's say, the capital of the country. Mostar is the capital of the Croatian part, and Banja Luka is the capital of the Serbian <coughs> part. But if you will travel to smaller, uh, villages and cities, don't say, don't show anything, but just look at the heads of the people. And you will see people with fingers cut, with fingers cut, with fingers cut. And you will know exactly who they are and who cut their fingers. 